Well, I want to just talk this morning about Jeremiah and the fact that Jeremiah was often referred to as the weeping prophet. And one of the reasons why he was referred to as the weeping prophet was the fact that even though he was bringing the messages of God, they were always, always being rejected. And so <laughs> that's enough to make you cry, isn't it? When you tell something what's going to happen and lo and behold they say nah that ain't going to happen but it did and so he told them about coming judgment he told them about the destruction of Jerusalem he told them about the Babylonian conquest coming and they paid no attention to him whatsoever so obviously he was very upset and that's the background to the story which I'm going to relate this morning and then I want to jump to Ezekiel chapter 10 and in Ezekiel chapter 10 as we read chapter 10 verse 18 Ezekiel sees something which for a Jew would be absolutely horrendous at that time he saw a picture of the glory of God leaving the Jerusalem temple their place of worship Ezekiel says God has left he's departed and so there are tremendous challenges for the Jews at this time. So we're looking in the 6th century BC, roughly, around about 597, when the first wave of the people living in Judea had been taken captives and taken over to Babylon. And so for Israel, they were going to experience a totally different life. There was total, and I emphasize the word, total readjustments everything would be changed from now on nothing would be the same and I, I find that appropriate to our situation today with regard to coronavirus now there are some things which I don't want you to jump into conclusions on so I'm not saying God brought coronavirus I'm just applying the things which we can learn from this situation up till this time the whole of Jewish religious experience revolved around the temple. Temple life, temple sacrifices, the priests at the temple, they had to go to the temple three times a year, if they could, to Pentecost, Harvest Festival and Passover. And suddenly, they haven't got a temple. It's been totally and utterly destroyed. That brings theological problems. Well, our whole religious situation has been thrown up into the air. What, what's God saying to us? And, and, and these things which were so important, the, the annual sacrifice, the Passover, the atoning sacrifice, it's not taking place any longer. We can't even go to the, to the temple and uh, bring a, a dove or, or some other offering. The whole of our life is altered and, and, and where we live, our jobs, mass unemployment. Can you imagine it? I mean, I don't know whether you ever thought about it, the number of people who would be employed in the temple, all the priests and all the people providing the sacrifices, the money changes, <laughs> much as you may or may not like them, everybody suddenly no work and then the general population their whole life has been altered because it wasn't just the top people who were affected every single person was affected and they've been thrown into a country where the customs the religion the culture even the language was totally and utterly different and lack of money lack of homes lack of everything they knew total devastation of what they'd known and so they're having to go to a totally new and different religious and cultural environment there's nothing the same i mean even top people like daniel as we know and his fellow countrymen 
we're being told to worship a foreign god or be thrown into a fire. So everything was utterly up in the air. And in the midst of that, there were false prophets. And these false prophets were saying, oh, it's only for a short time. It's just a tiny while. And then we, everything's going to be all right. All we'll be back to how it was. And those false prophets were condemned in very strong terms by God, uh, via Ezekiel <coughs> and Jeremiah. And God caused Jeremiah to write the letter, which we read in chapter 29, to the people living in that terrible environment, in a false environment in Babylon. Something they had never expected. He said, you're going to be there 70 years. Now, that would be a real shock to the system. They thought, hey, we prayed. God's going to turn it around. Give us a couple of months. It'll all work out. Nope. 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 70 long years. And how they would feel that God had let them down. How they would feel that God wasn't hearing their prayer. It challenges the whole of their theology. And today we can have a sort of theology which says that if something goes wrong, all we do is pray and it just changes. It doesn't work like that in practice. Jeremiah told them, not only are you going to be there 70 years, but you're going to have to start living as if that is how it's going to be. He says, build houses, settle down. Well, you don't settle down if you're going to be there a little while, do you? He says, not only that, marry. So it's a long-term commitment. Not only are you to marry, but you're to have children. Not only are you to have children, but you're to find partners for your children so that they can have children. So we're going to have grandchildren. It's a long-term thing. Now, this was absolutely horrendous to so many people. No, 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 that, that, it's not going, to, not going to be like that. It's going to, all short term, all short term. It says God wants you to multiply in exile and not decrease. Not only that, he says, but pray for the prosperity of the place which has held you captive. I mean, come on. That's, that's, that's a challenge and a half, isn't it? I mean, we've all had bosses and situations that we find impossible. And we wouldn't like to say it, but we hate. And God's saying, pray for their prosperity. And in our context, I think we've got to be praying for the prosperity of our nation, which is totally different to what we might want with totally different rules, totally different values in many areas to what we as a Christian would uphold. We're to pray that it's blessed. And God said, in you praying for their blessing, you too will be blessed. So a, a real challenge. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the things which happened during the exile and one of the things which I think will happen if it hasn't already during this present coronavirus situation of semi-lockdown, lockdown, call it whatever you like, is that it can produce a new class of legalistic spiritual leaders. Because it was during the exile that the Talmud was drawn up. It was during the exile that your professional clergy, the rabbi, etc., arose to the fore to explain in minute detail how the law applied, even though it didn't say it actually in the law. And so you got by Jesus' time, and still exists today, unfortunately, you've got so many rules and regulations about which part of your body you wash first, which part of the cup you hold, all, all of that sort of thing. 
the fact you couldn't eat some grain on on Saturday, the fact that you couldn't heal somebody on a Saturday. So all these laws arose and began to rise. Uh, and, and one of the things I think is likely to happen during this time is people are going to start, well, if we'd done this, if we'd done that, if we'd done the other, then coronavirus wouldn't have happened. And, and so therefore we've got to be much more stricter in our, I'll use the term religious, because it is religious, lifestyle. And it's not something that God instituted. It's something that, in my terms, the devil causes people to do when they've got idle hands and idle minds. And uh, for instance, I mean, just, uh, I don't know what you know about present practices, but for instance, it, we've been in, in uh, areas in Israel where you cannot press a button on a lift on the Sabbath. It goes up and down by itself or it doesn't go. The doors open by themselves because it's work. You couldn't have toast on the Saturday because it'd be work putting the toast into the toaster. Uh, and if you come to England, even, never mind living in Israel, uh, if you go to any of these areas, if you're living with some sort of strict um, religious people of Jewish descent, you'll find, for instance, you can't light a fire on a Saturday. So some of them even get friends to come and visit them. So they'll say it's cold. And they'll say, well, feel free to light the fire. I know friends of mine, one in Dagenham and one in London, who were often invited over at night so they could turn on the light switch because that was work on the Sabbath. All these horrendous rules and regulations. And it's easy to be say, well, that's just them. I wish it were. People are people. And we are people. And we are in England. And we have people. And we have religious people too who want to bring out all nasty little rules and regulations. So those are the negative things, as it were. Now I want to look at some of the positive things. For a start, the book of Daniel was written during this time in exile. Horrible experience, but great miracle, eh? Wonderful miracle. Something which changed uh, the whole of the situation and caused letters to be sent worldwide saying there was no God but the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And uh, you've also got uh, Esther uh, being written and things like that. So there are great things which will happen during our time too. Miracles will occur and people will talk about them. And although Ezekiel saw the glory of God leaving the temple in Jerusalem, he saw the same glory of God when he was by the river in exile as a prisoner. That's what you got to remember, they were prisoners. So if we feel that we're locked down, shut up, and all the rest of it, many people say, I feel like a prisoner. Well, in a sense, there is a, we, we are in prison situations. Praise God, not as bad as they were. But that doesn't stop you seeing the glory of God. Here he is, he's by a river. And he sees a vision of God. Not only does he see a vision of God, but he sees a vision of the same God who he had met and experienced and seen in Jerusalem, in the temple. God had, as it were, left the temple and come to them where they were. And if you think about it, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has not left a Christian because he's not worshipping in a building which some people have called the church, which they never should have done because it didn't. It's just a building, it's a hall that is used by people and is for a meeting. And so meeting outside doesn't stop them or us experiencing the power and visions of God. Absolutely wonderful. I, wa I want to read to you um, Ezekiel um, chapter 1 verse 26 to 28 again because it is really thrilling. He says, above the firmament, over the heads, was the likeness of a throne. There he is as a prisoner in a foreign land where he is feeling absolutely defeated. The nation is feeling defeated. They're feeling 
that God has left them. And here he is seeing God on a throne. Why do I say on throne? He said, because in appearance like the sapphire stone, on the likeness of the throne was the likeness and appearance of a man. We have a man called Jesus who is sat in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He is enthroned. He is in control, whether we, whether the coronavirus, whether anybody likes it or not. He is sat on that throne. And I noticed that it says, and from the appearance of his waist upwards, I saw it were the color of amber, with the appearance of fire around within it. And from the appearance of his waist downwards, I saw it were the appearance of the brightness of fire all around. Now, there'll be many people who'll be talking about the judgment of God upon Britain and the world uh, because of their lifestyle. And so they multiply that first bit and say the fire coming down from his waist. Well, if you go down from your waist, you reach your feet eventually, don't you? So the concept being, okay, it's God treading on people and judging them. But we don't stop there, do we? Ezekiel did not stop there. Because Ezekiel said, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. What? The rainbow. Why was the rainbow given? Because it's a sign of the covenant of God's grace, something we don't deserve, that we will be spared judgment. Praise God. And so here in, in Babylon, Ezekiel is being reminded God is a God of grace. A God who gives what we don't deserve. And that grace is the glory of his presence. Ezekiel saw God on the throne in the appearance of a man from the waist down fire, but like a rainbow on a cloudy day. Hallelujah. God is in total control, total and utter control. Jesus, our mediator, is there praying to the Father for us, praying blessing upon us. And we are subjects of grace, his grace. The early New Testament church suffered persecution. They were praying, but people were still being persecuted, imprisoned, killed, fed to animals. But nevertheless, the early church knew God was in control. They knew that God was with them. They met by rivers. They met in houses. They even met in temples that didn't belong to them. They met in the arena, <laughs> unfortunately. They met in schools. They met in prisons. But why? Could they experience the blessing of God? Because Jesus said, where two are three. Now, praise God, there are mega churches in the world. They do have a purpose. But Jesus said, where two or three. He didn't say where two or three million, or where two or three thousand, or where 20 or 30. But where two are three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. You see, the glory of the presence of God is him. That's the glory. It's him, himself. And he says, I'm there, where two or three people are. Not just in the temple at Jerusalem, not just by the river, but wherever two or three people are meeting in my name. And when you read the New Testament, that's what you see, that they were experiencing the blessing of God wherever they were. So I find that very encouraging, that we can know the presence of God where we are. And that should encourage us, encourage us to think, okay, so at present, on the 18th of, or 19th of September, 2020, the government said, well, we can only meet in up to six. Okay then, what's to stop us meeting in up to six? We can get together and Jesus will be in the midst. And I am I am grateful for things like Zoom and Google and goodness knows what else that have been experienced over the last few days. But it's not the same, in my experience, as actually being in the same room or the same garden or the same building or the same pub or the same cafe 
or the same area as other people where you just chat. If you can meet in a pub or a cafe or a park to have a meal, can you not meet in those same places to have your coffee and chat about Jesus and chat with each other about your life? Much more personal than Zoom. We've had people round here into our garden, into our house too. We've also been in other people's houses. It's a totally different context to a Zoom meeting. I'm not knocking Zoom as saying it's wrong, just saying let's extend our borders. Let's take the legal opportunities that we can to meet with others. I mean, I can remember when one of my friends was in charge of a very large uh, missionary organization, he had contacts with a very strong uh, communist country. Uh, where people were not allowed to meet as Christians. They were not allowed to say they were Christians. If you were, if you said, I am a Christian, you were literally, and I think it still applies today in a certain country I can think of, have to walk around with your head always bowed down as a sign of shame. And, um, I won't go into some of the horrible things that they, they do to the Christians in that country, but uh, one of the wonderful things that the Christians decided to do was they went for a walk. And it just so happened that, because you weren't allowed to meet with more than two people, it just so happened that two people would find themselves walking in the same direction at the same time. It just so happened that those two people happened to be Christians and their church considered, consisted of a walk and a talk and a pray and a chat as they walked along to their destination. No one would have known that they were meeting as a church where Jesus was in the midst. Very, very important. You see, when the Jews saw the glory of God leaving the temple, uh, you have to pitch that for 70 years, no more Passover sacrifice. Can you think of the theological implications of that? No more atoning sacrifice done, taking place. A phenomenal challenge, mind blowing challenge, and certainly one that would blow their religious theories out of the water. And I'm going to say that there are elements happening at the moment which I'm very glad for, because I'm hoping that some churches will have their religious concepts blown out of the water and their theology thoroughly, utterly and totally challenged so that they will never ever be the same again. And so they, because it, when we come to experiencing God in exile, it was personal. It wasn't related to a building. It wasn't related to all the religious paraphernalia and all the religious activities that they'd got up to. It was related to a relationship with a God who except for spiritual visions they could not see at the time when they had idols all around portraying gods of the nations they were in. And so I, I, to me, it's a time for us to remember what Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ in a building, the hope of glory, but Christ in you. You and I take the glory of God with us because we are the temple of God. And if the church could only wake up to that fact that the building has never ever been the church, it's just a building. Praise God for buildings, especially in England where it gets cold and wet and damp. 
but it never ever has been a church it is the people who are saved who are the temple of god they have or have not the presence of god in them depending upon their relationship with him whether they're saved or not if they're saved if they've been born again they've asked jesus christ in their life they are the temple of god they are carrying the presence of god they are experienced the presence of god and when two or more than me so six that's three times more than you you minimum required you're having the presence of god i think that is so wonderful to know and so take the opportunities you know thank god for your prayer breakfasts and all the other breakfasts and goodness knows what else you do by zoom but if you can i would beg churches to to consider meeting even if it's going and sitting as i know is happening in stratford where we live people going and sitting outside on chairs so that they're sitting at two minutes distance to have a a, a, a coffee they're taking flasks with them or sandwiches uh, uh, things like that just to meet with people because people are the church not a building and um, we might know the presence of god Church of God was not, is not built with hands. It is built by Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The saved people, the people who have been born again, who know Jesus as their own saviour, are the church. And then the passage which I will close with was in Jeremiah. Jeremiah's letter ended with this. He said, God's thoughts towards you in exile, and I believe these are God's thoughts towards us in our corona experience, exile as it were. God's thoughts to us are of peace. He said, I want you to experience me personally. I want you to have the best. I want you to know me. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not the peace which the world gives. So it's not based upon the circumstances. Those circumstances make us feel unhappy and can affect us terribly. He said, not only that, he said, but it's not coronavirus. It's not the Babylonians which are going to determine your future. I have a God-given future for you. And that's something else that which we need to remember. The end is not yet. God has our future in hand. And so therefore... Every step now, we need to be walking with him. So easy to concentrate on the past or on the future. If we concentrate on him, if we go to bed in the place which God wanted us to be today, we'll wake up in the place God wants us to be tomorrow. It's as simple as that. That's the best guidance for anybody that you can ever have. Do today what God wants you to do and you'll be in the right place tomorrow. Whereas you spend all day worrying about tomorrow, and that for you'll end up in the wrong place do today what god wants you to do god's thoughts to us are peace of a god-given future and a god-given hope hallelujah not only in this life do we have hope but should we die and many will die should we die of this horrible disease or should we die of anything else old age apart from anything else just natural causes we have a hope, the resurrection of the body from the dead. And this is a glorious hope, is it not? And one that we can pass on to all we meet. I mean, I was talking to a leader of a church only this week, and they're up to their eyeballs in all sorts of social activities. And praise God for social activities. But, as I pointed out to him, people are dying, and they don't know about Jesus. And you can have the best house. You could have been honed when you didn't have a home. You can be educated when you weren't educated. You can have lots of food. You can have lots of wealth. But if you haven't got Jesus, you are lost. Not just in this life, but for eternity. And that is the one message that the church, whether it has a building or doesn't have a building, has. Jesus Christ is our answer for the resurrection from the dead. The worst exile ever is being exiled to hell because it's for eternity therefore take the opportunities to meet together 
with Christians, with non-Christians. Don't just limit yourself to those you can reach on your Zoom, or on your contact list. Become friends. I've often said to one denomination, if they get rid of the word fellowship, put friendship into their statement of faith, it would challenge them completely. Challenge them completely. Because how many friends do we have? So that we have friendship and uh, tell people about Jesus. Now, perhaps as you're watching this, I don't know where this is going to be seen, but it's been seen on YouTube or wherever you're seeing it. But perhaps you don't know Jesus as your own Savior. Perhaps you've had a church life. Perhaps you've hated church life. Perhaps you've had experiences which are terrible within churches. Churches have people, and some people are terrible. But you know, Jesus has never done you any wrong. God has never done you any wrong. He says, I love you. My thoughts to you are of peace. I want you to know my peace. I want you to know my future, heaven, sins forgiven. I want to give you hope. If you unsure or haven't got that hope at the moment, why not just bow your head off? Just sit or stand wherever you are, seeing and say, God, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and save me. I give my life to you. And start to seek him. Because as Jeremiah also said, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. And take the opportunity to find out, perhaps wherever you saw this video, contact the church and say, I want to know more about this Jesus I've heard about this morning. Pray that God will bless each one of us, that we'll know the presence of God, where we are, and we will, if we can only meet with three, take the opportunity of three, because lockdown looks like it's going to get worse, but God has not left us. He still has a plan and a purpose for us. Be a blessing. May God bless you. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Patrick, I believe now. God bless you.